Oleg Sokolov was a well-respected history professor who also harbored a terrible secret. This isn't the one I'm referring to, despite the fact that he enjoyed dressing up and playing the infamous Napoleon. Napoleon's persona meant a lot to Oleg. He allowed his ego to dominate him, and even chose his companions based on whether or not they resembled Napoleon's wife, Josephine. Even worse, he frequently chose a student who was over 40 years his junior. These troubling facts are overshadowed, however, by his most dreadful secrets, since his private life was considerably worse than he made it appear to be. Tragically, this would all result in modern-day murder. The facts of this story will have you quite worried throughout, and believe me when I say that things don't get any better at the end either. This is the case of Anastasia Yeschenko. Welcome to the world's biggest nation. Of course, we're referring to the Baltic and Russia's unstable present-day territory. It should come as no surprise that this country, which has the biggest land area globally, is home to 145 million people, ranking it the ninth most populous country globally. Despite Russia's vastness, most people live in and around its cities because much of the nation is covered in unusable forests, plains, mountains, tundra, and even deserts. Even though the wilderness can be brutal, it can also be breathtakingly beautiful. Our example today, however, takes us to a slightly more urban setting, and more particularly, to the second largest city in Russia, being St. Petersburg's historical, distinctive, and cultural center. St. Petersburg is renowned for its historical significance, its European-influenced cross-Russian architecture, and its extensive network of canals and waterways, but it also has opulent palaces, parks, churches, and cathedrals, not to mention its magnificent antique architecture. Stop by one of the city's numerous authentic restaurants to sample some of the many different Russian specialities, including beef stroganoff, borscht, and even blini, which is the smaller Russian pancake's more official name, of course. Who else is feeling a bit hungry right now? The main subject of today's case is located here, near St. Petersburg's canals. Anastasia Yashenko, a postgraduate student, is 24 years old. She was born on April 26, 1995, to Galina and Oleg Yashchenko, and she spent her childhood in the little village of Stara Velichkovsky, which is situated in the extreme south of Russia, close to Crimea. Her mother was a police officer, while her father was a teacher. This meant that Anastasia was raised in a somewhat wealthy family that valued community along with her brother. She was a brilliant little girl, who also had contagious happiness. She even loved coming to school. She had earned great grades throughout her studies, proving to everyone that she was also intelligent. As she grew older, she continued to have a strong enthusiasm for history. She wished to establish herself as a respected historian someday. It caused her to enroll at St. Petersburg State University after graduating from high school. She performed exceptionally well in her historical studies, and to be even more precise, in her research into French history. Friends praised her talent and intelligence and noted her genuine enthusiasm for her work. Anastasia was so fascinated by history that she frequently dressed up and performed the parts of well-known historical figures, making her costumes. You could compare it to cosplay but with more Marie Antoinette and less fantasy. She breathed history, which went beyond her job and academic pursuits to include her friends and interests. She excelled in school, eventually replacing her lecturer Oleg Sokolov as his assistant. They would even go on to co-author a number of books and papers between the two of them. However, this is where the narrative takes a strange turn because Anastasia discovers that she and Oleg have a lot in common. In addition to the many fascinating tales Oleg could tell Anastasia, they both had a keen interest in historical drama. And yes, this did extend into the bedroom, as I can hear you asking. Oleg was completely enamored and fascinated with Napoleon, and he did a good job portraying this role in public and while sleeping. Oleg was incredibly attractive and flirtatious for his age, and after Anastasia graduated, the two grew extremely close. They would soon develop a love affair and then a sexual relationship, despite the fact that he was old enough to be her grandfather. Let's take a closer look at this person for a while. Oleg Sokolov was born in 1956, and the year our story takes place, 2019, found him to be 63 years old. Like Anastasia, he was a very well-known historical scholar who shared Anastasia's passion for French history in particular. More precisely, he was utterly fixated on the time of Napoleon. Oleg focused his study on this period in French history. He became so knowledgeable about it that he briefly spoke at the prestigious Sorbonne University. Among the notable graduates of this institution is Marie Curie, the first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize for her work studying radioactivity. He had to know his stuff if he was qualified to teach the French their history. 
and his receipt of the prestigious French Legion of Honor for his contributions to the field, made this evident. He centered everything in his life, professionally and personally, around his passion. Returning to his role play, Oleg organized lavish balls, picnics, and parties guests could attend in their finest period attire. He was one of the original organizers of these events in Russia. All of this now constitutes a type of live-action roleplay or LARP, but the persona you're playing is that of an aristocratic bachelor born in 1806 rather than a barbarian or an elf. Oleg took this interest very seriously, and I do mean it. He spent enormous money planning the events and even rode horses to further the illusion. He collected historical items specifically for use in his reenactments. As many of you are aware, Oleg frequently disguised himself as Napoleon Bonaparte, a notorious military leader and significant historical figure. The professor was a huge fan of Napoleon. Therefore, it only seemed logical that someone as arrogant and strong as Oleg would portray a likable role. His favorite subject to research was Napoleon, and the man even had a bust of the general in his upscale St. Petersburg residence. Oleg was an all-around smart, wealthy, and well-known man who allowed work to creep into his social and leisure time, which fascinated Anastasia. She was collaborating with one of the most renowned experts in her profession, so it was only natural for her to feel smitten. She was, oddly enough, exactly his type as well. She was a small brunette just like Josephine, Napoleon's wife. By the way, this was no coincidence. Oleg frequently captivated young ladies he believed would be his own Josephine. His preferences appeared to be based on a pattern. This mindset didn't seem to alarm Anastasia either. She enjoyed it, and she would dress appropriately to join him at his frequent reenactment gatherings. She was his Josephine, and he was her Napoleon. They would frequently act like their historical counterparts while dancing, drinking, and having fun together. It was now evident that Oleg had a particular aura, and a pretty conceited one. He required that everyone address him as Sir, whether he was in costume or not, during social gatherings. This also applied to Anastasia, who was more than willing to comply. However, Anastasia wasn't the first young lady to fall for his charms. She had no idea that he had previously attempted to build connections with a number of other pupils. He invited them to exclusive dinner parties where they might meet notable historians, and it appears that after one of these gatherings, he aggressively attempted to kiss one of his students. As with anyone in this circumstance, it can be challenging to say no to someone with this much notoriety and power. Oleg was aware of how terrifying the power dynamics were. Numerous students protested his behavior to the university welfare staff. Still, their complaints went unheard, and nothing was done about it. He frequently abused his position of authority to meddle in their affairs and make romantic advances. Sadly, this even worked with a few of them. Ekaterina Ivanova was one of many who acceded to his demands, although it wasn't for very long. It was a really unhealthy relationship, and Oleg was very abusive to her. To make her life revolve only around him, he imposed his interests and hobbies on her, dictated how she should dress and interact with others, and even cut her off from her friends and family. She was also instructed to give him a bow any time she saw him. And eventually, when the behavior turned violent, Ekaterina decided enough was enough. She wanted to go for other reasons as well, by the way. Around this time, she learned Oleg was already married, which was a stunning revelation. She made the decision to stop participating in this affair, and as a result, she was physically and verbally attacked. Although the incident was reported to the authorities, nothing further was done. Simply put, Oleg was too respected and influential in his industry to ever face competition. He was skilled at seducing young ladies and taking advantage of their weaknesses, and Anastasia was no exception. Oleg urged that she stay with him in his flat, situated on the famous Moika Embankment, after finishing her undergraduate studies and moving out of dorms for students. Despite being grateful for the offer, Anastasia was not aware that it was just another manifestation of Oleg's power over her. Mother Anastasia pleaded with her to reconsider. She understood that the relationship was unhealthy, even though she was dating an older man. It was rather clear after all. However, her daughter claimed that she was in the right relationship and that one day he would propose to her. After that, she soon moved into his not-so-humble dwelling and began assisting him with his lectures and papers. The two were content going forward, or so Anastasia believed. She was blind to the warning signs appearing more frequently and the fissures that gradually appeared throughout their relationship. 
She gradually became accustomed to extreme pressure due to Oleg's persecution over time. Anastasia eventually stopped visiting her relatives and friends, stopped speaking to her mother, and gradually lost interest in her side interests. Now that Oleg was her whole focus, she had no idea their connection would eventually result in an unfathomable disaster. November 9, 2019, is the date. The majority of the city continued to sleep through the early morning hours, as those working night shifts went about their business in peace. On this calm morning, a local cab driver named Asver Jan pulled over to the side of the Moika River for a cigarette break. As he was doing it, a man screamed in distress, abruptly breaking the peaceful night serenity. Oleg asked the taxi driver to rescue him instead of calling the police because the shouting appeared to be coming from the river. However, there was no real way to get to him because of the river's steep banks. He chose to dial 911 out of concern for Oleg's safety during the relatively severe Russian winter. Police and paramedics showed up not long after, and it was at this point that Asveryan's death was made public. Services, Asveryan's death was not an accident. Police and paramedics showed up not long after, and this is when the narrative takes a very dark turn. After rescuing Oleg from the river, they discover he was carrying a large, hefty black knapsack. One of those paramedics chose to take a peek inside because his curiosity got the better of him. When he did, he made a horrifying discovery. He looked down and noticed two human arms. And to everyone's amazement, this rather straightforward rescue effort abruptly evolved into a criminal inquiry. Once in detention, the authorities started looking into Oleg's possession of a pair of human arms, and more significantly, who on earth they belonged to. The police quickly apprehended Oleg. According to statistics, the murderer's partner is typically the victim, so it didn't take long to determine that Anastasia Yashchenko's arms were brutally severed. Divers searched the riverbed for other evidence because they thought the river might be concealing some other sinister secrets. After only two days of searching, they discovered her legs and chest. A brief but sinister aside, it appears that the Moika River conceals several terrifying mysteries. They discovered a man's bones during their hunt but no one has ever been able to identify him. I suppose we can never be sure what is beneath the surface. By delving into their inquiry and using Oleg's own testimony, security footage, and stories from Anastasia's friends and family, we can construct an ambiguous but comprehensible series of events that ultimately resulted in the young woman's death. After a disagreement with Oleg, Anastasia called her brother two days before her remains were found on November 7th. She claimed that he hit her after she wanted to attend a friend's birthday celebration, sounding visibly distressed over the phone. The family was aware of the couple's precarious situation, but unaware of how far things had fallen. Soon after their first conversation, she called her brother once more, but Anastasia's voice was robotic and fake. She assured him that everything had been taken care of and that he didn't need to worry. However, all of this was a ruse, and the fighting continued. She had been coerced into lying to her family by Oleg. In addition, he accused her of infidelity, saying that her friend's party was just a pretext for her to see another man. Sadly, his aggressiveness escalated as the dispute did. It is hardly surprising that many of the artifacts he gathered were weapons, given that he was a historical reenactor. He pulled a sawn-off shotgun from the wall and fired it at Anastasia in a rage. The first shot did not fatally wound her. Oleg repeatedly reloaded the shotgun, firing four shots at the woman until she succumbed to her wounds. After shoving the body beneath the bed in the subsequent room because he didn't know what to do with it, he thought about his next course of action. However, Oleg made it plain that he was in no rush at all by throwing a party in his apartment the following day. And Anastasia's lifeless body lay in the adjacent room as his friends sipped beverages and nibbled on light fare. Oleg ultimately decided what he was going to do later that evening. As you can probably imagine, he used a saw and a kitchen knife. He split Anastasia into pieces and placed each piece in a different bag. After that, he had the brilliant idea to drown her corpse in the Moika River, conveniently located outside his flat. A surveillance camera along the riverbed records him throwing away many bags, including her body on his second visit and her legs on his first. The taxi driver would later discover him in the freezing river after he fell in while carrying the bag containing her arms on his third journey. Authorities searched his apartment and discovered Anastasia's final remains. Included with this was her head, which was encased in an Ikea bag. Oleg stated during his interrogation that if he managed to avoid being apprehended, he intended to dress as Napoleon, travel to the Peter and Paul fortress, and then commit suicide in front of the public. In my opinion, 
It is utter madness. What was his rationale for killing his lover then? Well, it appears like the two had a furious argument. Oleg didn't want to introduce Anastasia to her friends, and she casually mentioned one of his daughters. Oleg asserted that he was defending himself. He said that Anastasia was the one who started acting violently during their fight, according to the investigators. Additionally, he says the woman allegedly lunged at him with a knife. Although this is highly unlikely to be the case given what we already know, unfortunately we will never truly know. Officers and courts are now frequently sympathetic toward men who are accused of abusing women, at least in Russia. Many men assert that their wives or partners incite them to act violently, and they frequently allege that they have been falsely accused. Of course, this is a possibility. Oleg's history of domestic abuse, however, refuted his assertions. Family members of Anastasia were convinced that she would never hurt anyone, let alone stab someone she cared about. She would never act in such a way. And speaking of her family, they were completely let down by the authorities throughout the course of the investigation. Not only would they fail to get in touch with her family at the moment of the incident or immediately after, but her family would also learn about it from TV and online searches. Oleg was found to be entirely sane and capable of standing trial after a psychological examination. They also demonstrated that he knew fully what he was doing when he killed Anastasia. Oleg Sokolov's murder trial began in December 2020 for the killing of Anastasia Yeschenko. Her family was present during this time and spoke about their own impacts. As you might expect, Oleg clung to his justification of self-defense. According to him, Anastasia was a perfect woman, and she was very kind to him, he told the judge. But that November night, she changed totally from the person she usually was, turning into a monster. In addition, he asserted that after firing the first shot, the rest of the evening was a blur, and that he had no memory of it. He went on to say that he was so overcome with guilt that he intended suicide, but required some time to prepare his will and other legalities. This appears to be the motivation behind the dismemberment and disposal of Anastasia's body, which was done to buy him some time. Oleg could hire the best attorney since he was wealthy, and they all worked to obtain the shortest sentence possible. He had previously admitted to killing his sweetheart, so he was already in trouble. His attorney tried to reduce his punishment for the crime to just eight years. Oleg Sokolov was finally given a 12 and a half year prison term for the murder of Anastasia Yashchenko after this plea deal fell through. If you think about it, it is still far too short of a sentence. The judicial system in this nation differs significantly from that in other countries. In Russia, the maximum sentence for murder is merely 12 to 20 years in prison, with life in prison only an option in the most extreme circumstances. Many young women spoke up about their interactions with Oleg after he was sentenced, and most of them displayed improper and violent behavior. Nevertheless, no action was ultimately taken against the lecturer, and it is easy to understand why. The man obviously had a lot of influential friends who could look out for him and use their influence to, in a sense, get him off the hook. It is somewhat shocking to find that Oleg filed an appeal following his conviction, despite his sentence being only six months longer than the required minimum. Despite his bravado, he appeared to be sincerely sorry for his acts. In front of her parents in court, he apologized profusely for what he had done and wished he could have returned her to her family. As a result, he expressed regret and begged for their pardon. Unsurprisingly, the family rejected his motion was denied and their attorney essentially ordered him to shove off. Oleg's penalty, however, was mild, to put it mildly, and ultimately he was imprisoned in his city at an unknown prison. His cell now has marble flooring and a heated fireplace during the winter. Additionally, he enjoys exclusive use of a private library to carry out his research. A cantina with a fridge and even social rooms where he can play pool and snooker whenever he wants are available as additional amenities. One of these gathering spaces even has a flat-screen TV where he may watch the news and perhaps even this video. His attorneys claim that although their client has no concerns about his living circumstances, he is nevertheless looking forward to being released. Several other Russian convicts convicted of far smaller offenses starkly contrast this. Alexei Navalny is one of Vladimir Putin's detractors, for example. Alexei is now a lawyer, activist, and campaigner against corruption. Due to his alleged radicalism against the leader of Russia, which included planned marches, nonviolent protests, and an effort to run for office in opposition to the corrupt Russian laws, he was detained and sentenced to nine years in prison. Despite this man receiving numerous honors for his work promoting human rights, he was detained and later found guilty of theft and contempt of court. 
He was held in terrible filth, despite the fact that this was a much less serious offense than murder. And I'm talking about Gulag from Call of Duty being worse. He was housed in an unfinished concrete cell with little furniture, a wooden board as his bed, and a toilet built into the floor. This contrasts sharply with a murderous, aggressive, and abusive professor, housed in what can only be characterized as a luxury, highlighting how corruptly Russian laws and punishments are carried out. In contrast to many other nations, detention and containment strongly correlate with the seriousness of the offense and behavior while in custody. Oleg enjoyed benefits throughout his life due to his standing and reputation, which allowed him to keep his employment, avoid serious allegations, and even avoid doing time in an intolerable prison for the death of another person. Additionally, this wasn't just another person. Aside from being his girlfriend, she was a beloved daughter, friend, and young woman who cherished and adored this man. She sacrificed a significant portion of her life to be with him. Because he influenced her, she would never be in a position where she could claim victory. She was only picked for her looks and her desire to become Oleg's Josephine. She was secluded, under control, and exploited. When Oleg was acting according to those around him, the boundary between himself and Napoleon was frequently blurred, and it appeared he had taken on the entire personality of the historical figure. Additionally, although he was psychologically well, he occasionally appeared to believe that he was Napoleon, or at the very least, a manifestation of him. Through his delusions, he enticed a lovely young woman into being a victim of his charms, power, and domineering nature, which finally resulted in her tragic and senseless death. Intelligent and driven, Anastasia Yushchenko made every effort to realize her goals. Throughout her life, she was a cherished daughter, sister, and friend to many, and nobody had a harsh word to say about her. Her family was devastated by losing their loved one, and her funeral was filled with tears. Her mother, who had always been a hopeless romantic, decided that she should be buried in a white dress since she had always imagined being there to help choose it for the momentous occasion that would no longer take place. To conclude this case, I'd like to know your opinion of Oleg's sentence because, in my opinion, 12 and a half years is not long enough. Additionally, he is living in the lap of luxury. Oleg is scheduled to be freed from prison in May 2032, as of the time this video was published, and it's doubtful that this date will alter. That pretty much concludes our case for today. I appreciate you watching this video. I genuinely value your being here. I'll be back shortly with another video, as usual. But until then, keep in mind to take care of yourself, take care of one another, and of course stay safe. Regards and goodbye.